verses 4 through 6 of uh, Hebrews 6 here are commonly regarded as warnings against the sin of apostasy. Um, And you'll notice the title that I've placed in the bulletin is a warning against apostasy. Uh, we uh, uh, We have a cliche that we often say, it's a woman's prerogative to change her mind. That may not be very polite, but uh, I'd like to uh, adapt that little saying and say it's a pastor's prerogative to change his mind. And so I have changed in midstream, and um, I'd like to give you a revised title for this. And it may not sound much different, but as we'll see as we get into the message, uh, it does have a different bearing. So I'd like to call this a warning about falling away. A warning about falling away. And uh, I came into this passage with a pretty clear idea of what I thought this passage meant and how to interpret it. Uh, And about half to three quarters of the way through my preparation, I realized that I'd been barking up the wrong tree and I needed to revise my interpretation to fit what the passage was actually saying. So, um, um, you know, 30 years into my ministry, this is, uh, you're hearing for the first time, my thoughts on uh, what this text means from a new perspective. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 6, and the entire text that we'll be eventually covering goes from verse 4 to verse 12, and this is one unit of text. Um, And it's very obvious as we get into the first three verses of these uh, of this passage that the text here is uh, talking about a warning. The question, uh, and this is the question that is faced by many interpreters, there's uh, a large number of differing interpretations that have been used to explain this passage about exactly what it is that this passage is warning about. Um, But tonight, because of the difficulty of this passage, we're going to be restricting ourselves to the first three verses. So we'll be looking at verses 4 through 6 tonight. But uh, to set the stage, because this is a unit of text, we're going to read uh, from verse 4 through verse 12, and then next week we'll continue and finish out this passage. So let's read together. I'm going to ask if you would just go ahead and read it aloud with me. And we'll read verses 4 through 12. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we are thankful that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that as we look into your word, we have an interpreter uh, who can help us to make sense of what you have said, and not only to understand its meaning, but to understand its application, to uh, recognize uh, how we must respond uh, in obedience to what we have seen and heard. And we pray that tonight... Your spirit would help us as we uh, wrestle with this passage and try to understand its meaning as you intended, that we would also 
uh, have the wisdom to be able to uh, use what you say to us by responding with obedience and faith, that you would help us to go on and grow in our spiritual lives to the point of maturity, that we would uh, not fall uh, after the example of unbelief as the generation in the wilderness did. So we pray that you would help us tonight, that we would uh, have uh, uh, enlightenment and wisdom as we look into your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it's indisputable that this passage contains a warning concerning spiritual danger. But the problem is that interpreters are, are strongly divided. In fact, uh, one of the commentaries I read this week suggested there are five major interpretations for this passage that differ radically from one another. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go and try to explain all the ways of, of uh, interpreting this text, but I'd like for us to work together through the passage and discover what I believe uh, God is trying to teach us as we look into these verses. Uh, it's also important to recognize that verses 4 through 6 in the Greek are one sentence. And so this is a very complicated sentence, and in fact, uh, the actual subject of the sentence doesn't come until verse 6. Uh, so the, the order uh, of the sentence is different from what we're used to in our English language. You'll notice the very first word, or the second word actually, in our English translation is it. And you'll notice that it is in italics in our New King James Bible, which means that this word is not actually there. The translators have put it in to help clarity because in English... Uh, uh, a, a verb must have a subject. Well, there is a subject, but the subject doesn't actually occur until verse 6. So if we, it will help us if we just understand the grammatical kernel of this sentence. So here is simplified what this, uh, these three verses are saying. It's saying, it is impossible to renew to repentance the ones who fall away. Let me just say that one more time. That's, that's this whole sentence condensed down to the kernel. Uh, it is impossible to renew to repentance the ones who fall away. So we're going to carefully examine this text, and we're going to try to determine the facts concerning this warning. There are some questions that we need to answer. For instance, who are the ones that are in danger of falling away? Who is it talking about? Or secondly, what are the consequences in this passage of falling away? Or thirdly, how can we avoid this danger? Does it even apply to us? So to begin with, I'd like for us just to remind ourselves about the context in which this warning is given. And one of the problems, I think, with uh, uh, the way people it, uh, have interpreted th these verses is they tend to remove them and take them as a theological problem and attempt to solve it uh, uh, outside of the context in which it appears. And in fact, that's impossible to do. We have to understand that the author is giving this warning within the context of everything else that he is saying to us in this book. So just to kind of back up and remind ourselves of what's going on, remember in chapters 3 and 4, uh, the author is warning about the dangers that uh, uh, that were illustrated for us by the wilderness generation of Israel. At Kadesh Barnea, when uh, instead of obeying God's command and believing God's promise to go into the land of Canaan, we're told that they, uh, they attempted to choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And so uh, uh, we see that there are some warnings that are given about the danger of not entering into God's rest. And uh, we interpreted one of the uh, key meanings of that word rest is it's talking about the promised inheritance, uh, which for us uh, involves two aspects. It involves our eternal inheritance, but it also involves the rest that we experience as we walk in our lives today in faith and uh, allow God to, uh, to um, be God in our lives, respond to him in faith and obedience. And so that is a present uh, application of that rest. Then in chapter 5, it introduced to us the topic of Christ's high priesthood. 
that he is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But then before he can actually begin to teach us much about what this actually means, he stops in verse 11 and uh, and offers a warning to believers about the danger of reverting to spiritual immaturity. Uh, in 6.1, he explains that it is impossible to lay the foundation of, re- of Christian experience a second time. And this provides the immediate background for the warning here in verses 4 through 6. So therefore, we need to understand that this is a warning that is spoken to us as believers. Uh, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. But just to begin with, let's remember the fact that Scripture is always written first for Christians. God gave us his word in order that we might benefit as believers, his children. And so we recognize that this is a message that is for us as Christians today. Now, what is the author's concern? Well, he's concerned. Remember in 411, look in chapter 4 and verse 11, he said, let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So he's worried, he's concerned that they're going to fall in unbelief. That word disobedience could also be translated unbelief. Then notice in chapter 5 and verse 12, he's concerned because of their spiritual immaturity. And this is not an innocent immaturity of the new believer, but it is the the sinful response to persecution and temptation, which has caused them to revert in their Christian experience or attempt to revert in their Christian experience to spiritual infancy. And so in chapter 6 and verse 1, he exhorts them, let us go on to perfection or let us go on to maturity. And so this warning in verses 4 through 6 is necessary because when we face persecution and pressures, we too are tempted to respond toward God with immaturity, with unbelief, and with disobedience. And as we saw in the case of the wilderness generation, this has tragic consequences in our lives. This is why the author says what he says in verses 4 through 6. So I'd like to offer this uh, suggested theme for what we're going to be looking at Uh, in the larger context here through verse 12, but that is you must diligently pursue spiritual maturity because spiritual failure brings severe consequences in the present and for eternity. Let me just say that one more time. You must diligently pursue spiritual maturity because spiritual failure brings severe consequences in the present and for eternity. So there are four elements of this warning that should motivate us to diligently pursue spiritual maturity. Now, from chapter four, from verse four down to verse twelve, this entire section is all dealing, uh, in some way or another, with the warning that occurs in verses four through six. They're all all of this section is related to this warning. So let me just divide up this larger text for us to a kind of chart the course that we'll be covering uh, in the next few weeks. But notice, first of all, we have an explanation of this warning in verses 4 through 6. We have an illustration of this warning in verses 7 through 8. We have a qualification of this warning in verses 9 and 10. And by that word qualification, I mean uh, an adjustment. He's qualifying the seriousness of what he says Uh, in the warning earlier. And then finally, in verses 11 through 12, we have an application of this warning. So we're going to see that this warning does have a very clear application in our lives. We're not going to get to that uh, scriptural application until next time. But tonight, I'd like for us to just focus on verses 4 through 6 and try to sort through this text and come to a clear understanding of exactly what the author is trying to communicate to us in this warning. So notice as we begin looking at the explanation of this warning, we have some questions that we need to ask. And we've already mentioned some of these, but notice the first question that we're going to begin with, uh, uh, because it's what the first part of these verses are dealing with, is an understanding, a clear understanding, 
of who is this warning given to? Who is this warning given to? And the reason we say that is because uh, there are some interpretations of this passage that would basically uh, take this warning and say that it doesn't apply to believers. That this is, uh, in some cases, they say this is a hypothetical warning. The author is simply uh, 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 mentioning a hypothetical situation that can never actually occur. Uh, there are other interpretations, too, that we see. It's important that we grasp at the beginning, and in fact, that is the first thing the author is saying in verses 4 and 5, who is this warning to? And we've already kind of answered this question in advance. This is a warning to us as believers. We notice that in verses 4 and 5, there are uh, five verbal clauses that are parallel. Now, um, these five verbal clauses, one of them, the fourth one, uh, is actually uh, has uh, two grammatical objects. So it's, it's kind of a dual statement. That's the one when it talks about tasting the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Both of these are linked to the same verb here. But there are five verbal clauses in these verses that describe who this warning actually applies to. And as we read through these, um, uh, it becomes very clear as we look at the meaning and explanation of what the author is saying about who these people are, that this is a description of the experience of a person who is a true believer. And there are some that would take these five statements and say these are not uh, 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 a, a Christian these are, this is describing a person who looks like a Christian and acts like a Christian, but he's not truly converted. And so they would take this statement and say, these warnings do not apply to us as Christians because it's describing the false Christian or the counterfeit Christian. But I think if we're candid, as we look through these five statements, we're, all, we're, we're forced to the conclusion that these are descriptions of experiences that people only have if they are truly a converted and born-again child of God. So let's just look at these one at a time and see exactly what they're saying. Notice, first of all, he says uh, in verse 4, for it is impossible, the first statement is, for those who were once enlightened. Now, the word enlightened here is a verb. It means to give light. Metaphorically, as it's used here, it means to be taught or instructed so as to possess spiritual understanding. Now, it's the Holy Spirit who is the uh, person of the divine trinity who opens the spiritual understanding of people and causes them to understand the gospel, to recognize Christ as the Messiah and Savior. It is the Holy Spirit who is the one who illuminates the human heart uh, uh, and brings them to the point of conversion. Uh, now, we can also talk about another uh, uh, related um, source of illumination that I think we can draw into this passage, though it's not directly related. You remember at the beginning of John's Gospel, uh, there's a statement in those early verses. It's talking about Jesus, who is the Word of God, and we're told that Jesus is the light who lighteth every man who comes into the world. That Jesus Christ is God and that by entering uh, 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 the human, uh, human society and the human sphere, he illuminated mankind with the truth of who God is and what God is like. That Jesus Christ himself is the one who illuminates all mankind. But the actual application of that illumination is made by the Holy Spirit in the human heart. It's, uh, it's the Holy Spirit who must open the eyes of the spiritual understanding and enable the sinful human being to understand and grasp God's truth. So the word here, once, is significant. He says here that he was once, those who were once Enlightened, And this is a key word in the book of Hebrews to describe an event that occurs once for all time. 
Uh, it is a one of a kind event. Uh, just as we talked about laying the foundation is a one time event. Here, this is talking about the enlightenment of the human soul by which he understands and is able to respond to the gospel with repentance and faith. And so here, this is emphasizing the once for all event in which an individual comes to understand God's truth effectually so that he or she can respond to it with faith in Christ for salvation. And we come to the second statement. It says, uh, and have tasted the heavenly gift. This word taste is significant. In fact, it's repeated twice in these verses. You see it in verse 4 and verse 5. When it occurs again in verse 5, as we've already said it, it has, uh, as we've already stated, it has two objects, uh, to taste the word of God and then also to taste uh, uh, the powers of the age to come. Uh, So here this word taste is a significant word to describe what is taking place or what the author is describing in these verses. The word to taste here means to enter into a full experience of something. Now, there are some people, again, that would would try to say that these are descriptions of people that uh, come close to being Christians, but they never actually become Christians. And so they would say that this, this word taste is a word that describes the ability to taste something without actually eating it or without actually swallowing it. And that these people have an initial experience without the full experience. But the problem with this is that is not what this word means. In fact, in its usage, it's always associated with tasting in the sense of eating. Uh, And we can also see this even here in the book of Hebrews. Turn back to chapter 2 and verse 9. Here it's talking about an experience that Jesus went through in chapter 2. In verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Now, we can't say that Christ simply tasted death, but he didn't fully experience. In fact, we understand that Christ experienced death to its full extent, that he fully experienced death, And this word here, when it says that they tasted the heavenly gift, means that they have fully entered into the experience and enjoyment of the heavenly gift. Well, what is the heavenly gift? Well, it's talking here about God's gift of eternal life and salvation. Uh, It's talking about the fact that God has graced us or gifted us with salvation in and through Christ. And so here this indicates that these people have fully experienced God's salvation. They've tasted the heavenly gift. Notice thirdly, they share in the Holy Spirit. The word sharers means a full participation in something. Believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, and they become sharers of the Holy Spirit by means of his presence, his gifts, his leading, and his comfort. And we could also add his enlightenment, uh, the experience of teaching us God's truth. Uh, In the book of Acts, there's a statement that is often repeated. It's talking about the believers in the early church that regularly they experienced what is called being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, That is a literal translation of that term, and yet it's easy for us to misunderstand what uh, uh, what that metaphor is trying to communicate to us. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And if you can be filled with the Holy Spirit many times, do we actually need more of the Holy Spirit all the time? And the answer to that, of course, is no. The filling of the Holy Spirit has to do with Not with us getting more of the Spirit, but with the Spirit getting more of us. That we uh, are submitted and uh, surrendered to the control and to the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And in fact, when we receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, we receive Him in full measure. We cannot receive more of the Holy Spirit because when we received Him, we received all of Him. We received all. 
the Holy Spirit. We're sharers. Uh, uh, we have a full participation in the Holy Spirit. And so again, this is a description of something that only a, a true born again child of God can experience. We understand that, yes, unbelievers experience the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. They can even experience to a degree the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit in which he uh, shows them and convinces them of God's truth. And yet they can turn away. But the description that we see here is describing something that is beyond simply illumination. It's describing participation, that we become full participants uh, of the Holy Spirit. And we see, uh, as we mentioned, uh, number four and number five are linked together. It says that they taste the good word of God. Uh, That word good is uh, an adjective that actually is, uh, we could shift that around to the end of this clause and we could translate it this way. They have tasted that the word of God is good. They have tasted the goodness of the word of God. And so here the emphasis is not just that they've tasted the word of God, but that they've tasted the word of God that reveals to them the benefits and the goodness of its uh, 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 of what it provides for us in their own experience. Now, this word tasted, again, is talking about a full experience. And so here as believers, we have experienced the word of God and we have uh, come to, uh, had the experience to recognize the good benefits which it has brought into our lives. It's something that we have fully experienced. So the word of God here is a reference to the written scriptures. In... Uh, in the context here of uh, of the uh, of the book of Hebrews, this, at this time the New Testament scriptures were not completed. This is primarily a reference to the Old Testament scriptures, and so here uh, the idea is that as these early believers were studying their uh, their Old Testament scriptures and they were experiencing the benefits, the good benefits that they were receiving through the word of God in their lives. Uh, The written scriptures contain God's promises, his covenants, and his laws. And as God's people learn to uh, take in the word of God in their lives, it nourishes their faith, it comforts them, it instructs them, it, it rebukes them, and it gives them hope. And so these are experiences that we have as children of God. Let me just say this. If you have no appetite for the word of God, that is a serious concern. Because true believers have an appetite for the word of God. This word taste emphasizes here that, uh, of course, here it's metaphorical. But it's talking about the fact that it's something that we experience and enjoy. And so as believers, it is our privilege and our enjoyment to spend time in God's word and to experience the benefits of God's word in our lives on a regular basis. Then he also goes on to say, not only have they tasted that the word of God is good, but they've also tasted the powers of the coming age. Now, the coming age is a reference to the future age of Messiah's glory and kingdom. Messiah has come. Uh, That's what we saw in, uh, we just mentioned the book of John, when Jesus uh, was the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, and that at Jesus' first coming, the powers of the messianic age were, uh, were introduced into the human environment. Um, the the powerful display of God's working, which will be a prominent feature of the future kingdom age, were already introduced at the first coming of Christ. Let's just look back at chapter 2 for a minute. And we see where uh, it actually combines these two things just as it is here in our, uh, in our today's text. 
uh, it combines the word of God and the power of God connected with Christ's first coming. Look at chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So the word powers here is a reference. It's the common word used in the New Testament for the miraculous works of Christ. And so we see in the earthly ministry of Christ, the powers of the Messianic age were introduced into human uh, experience. And as Jesus Christ completed his ministry, and he uh, uh, not only did he perform these works of mercy and healing, but he gave his life as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. He died, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And the resurrection of Christ is the preeminent uh, demonstration of God's power that is available for us in this present age. And so the point is that just as God's power was uh, uh, radically intervened in human history in the person of Christ through his miraculous works, and we saw that also in the early church as his apostles performed these miracles to confirm the word of God that was given. And we as Christians have experienced that power in our own lives. Even though Jesus now has ascended into heaven, he's at God's right hand, he's waiting until God puts his enemies under his feet. And so when Christ returns, he will establish his kingdom publicly. It will be a public demonstration of the power of God at work in human society. And yet that power is already at work in our lives as believers. We have already begun to experience that power, even though Christ has not yet come. Because the Messianic age began with the first coming of Christ, we have experienced God's power in an evident and unmistakable manner. So we see there's this five-fold description, and it's clear that this is a description of the experience of true believers. Now, just to be up front and to help us understand why there is such a wide range of interpretations on this passage is because of a particular fact about These verses. As I mentioned, it's one verse. It's one unit of thought. They can't be divided. We can't break it in half somewhere, which uh, a lot of interpreters would like to do. But because it's closely united, the first half sounds like Christians. But the second half, as we look at God's condemnation of this particular sin and of the punishment that it involves and of the, uh, the, the spiritual import of what committing this sin means, it sounds like something that is too serious and dangerous for a true Christian to ever experience. So how do we put the two halves of this verse together? Because the first half, it sounds uh, fairly unmistakably that it's talking about Christians, and yet when we get to the second half, we're going to see that it sounds like this is something that could never happen to a Christian. But we need to begin at the beginning. That's what the author has done. He's begun with this clear presentation of the experience of true Christians, and I believe that's significant. That we need to recognize the author here is speaking to us as Christians. We can't shuffle this warning off onto somebody else. And so we need to begin by making this initial observation about this warning. It's a warning given to people that are really saved, who have experienced fully God's saving activity in their lives. So that answers this first question, who is this warning to? It is a warning to believers. Then we come to the second part of this uh, passage, and we have another question. What is this warning about? 
What exactly is it talking about? What is it describing? What is this sin? What is this danger? What is this warning? And again, I'd like to answer this question in advance and then we'll go through and work through the passage carefully. But this is talking about falling aside through failure to go on to maturity. Falling aside through failure to go on to maturity. That is what this context is pointing to. So notice, he says, if we get down into verse 6, if they fall away. Now again, here's an, another observation. Uh, we notice that little word if there. And in fact, in the Chinese version of this passage, we see it has the Chinese word for if inserted here in this place. But this is, uh, this is a kind of a curious translation because the word if does not actually occur in these verses. In fact, the word to fall away here is a verbal phrase which is exactly, exactly parallel to the previous five statements. In fact, uh, it's, it's talking about it's in the same series as the previous five terms. And so, uh, uh, really, the word that does occur here is not the word if, it's the, the normal conjunction, the word and. And it's the same conjunction that has linked these previous five statements. And so it is continuing on, and we see that here we see this sixth statement, which is coordinated with the previous five. It's saying, these people and they fall away. The conclusion that we're forced to come to is that this is a sin that Christians can commit. The problem comes is because most people read this term, fall away, and they immediately, uh, in their mind, they translate this as the word apostasy. To depart from the faith, to surrender the faith, to turn away from Christ, uh, to, to give up uh, the Christian life. But what this verse says is, and... They fall away. So we need to determine what does this mean to fall away. Uh, Again, since these are true believers, this is important for us to, to, to understand. Look down at verse 10. We just see another thing. This just is another confirmation to, to our uh, Uh, our initial observation here. He says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. So the author here is addressing this warning to Christians. So even though this term is commonly used uh, to refer to the sin of apostasy, I say commonly, it's commonly by interpreters. It's commonly used to refer to the sin of apostasy. But this word that occurs here. This is actually the only time this word occurs in the entire New Testament. So we're not going to get any help by saying, oh, in another passage it means apostasy because there is no other passage that uses this exact term. So we're going to have to come to an understanding of this term by another message, uh, method. First of all, let's, let's, let's develop a definition. What is apostasy? Let me just give you a definition that will help us to think clearly and carefully uh, as, as we look at this text. First of all, what is apostasy? Apostasy is to turn away finally and completely from a previously held profession of faith in Christ. So this is a person who previously professed Christ. Uh, He was in our churches. He looked like a Christian. He acted like a Christian. But at some point, he turns away from Christ. He rejects his faith. And he walks away from Christianity. This is what apostasy is. And in fact, there are other passages of Scripture that do describe this sin. My problem is that I don't believe this passage is teaching about this sin. Because this passage is addressing Christians. And if these people who commit apostasy were never born again, were never true Christians, then a Christian cannot commit the sin of apostasy. 
This is, this is basic fundamental theology that we hold as basic to our faith that a born-again child of God can never lose his salvation. Uh, many passages of Scripture teach this truth. Uh, John 10, 26 through 30 is one of them, but we're not going to take the time to go there. But it should be clear from our definition of apostasy that this is not a sin which a true believer can commit. Now, in this sense... The, uh, the, the sin of apostasy is similar to what Jesus called the unpardonable sin. We saw that passage in our scripture reading earlier. And Jesus was warning the Pharisees that they were in danger of committing the sin that could never be forgiven. Well, how are these two sins similar and how are they different? Well, they're both similar in that they are both committed by unbelievers. If we want an example of apostasy, we we look at the person Judas. Judas was chosen by Jesus Christ himself as his apostle. Judas was indistinguishable from the other 12 apostles. He performed miracles in the name of Christ. He went out and announced the uh, the coming of the kingdom of God uh, and the coming of the Messiah. Uh, And uh, if you looked at Judas, from the outside, there is nothing that we could look at that we would say that this is not a true believer in Jesus Christ. But at all the time that Judas was doing these things outwardly, we know that there was something else entirely going on in his heart because the scripture tells us. It tells us he was a thief. And so all this time that he is... Uh, He is the treasurer for the apostolic ban. He's uh, taking money out of the till and uh, robbing the till. Uh, He had a covetous heart. And it's obvious that that Judas was motivated by the, the prospect of gaining fame and position and wealth by his association with Jesus, who was apparently the Messiah. And so we see the time came when Christ's crucifixion drew near. Judas could see the handwriting on the wall and he realized that he was not going to get those things that he wanted. And his response was to sell Christ to his enemies for 30 pieces of silver. Now afterwards, Judas had remorse. He was sorry for what he'd done. He realized that he had done a bad thing by, uh, uh, by selling uh, an innocent person to death in the hands of his enemies. And so he tried to take the money back and give it back to the high priests. But he could not find a place to return to repentance. And in fact, he died by suicide. That is the picture of apostasy that we see in other passages of Scripture. So... Both of these sins, the sin of apostasy and the sin of the unpardonable sin, are both committed by unbelievers. The difference between these sins is that apostasy is committed by professing believers who are outwardly connected with Christ. The unpardonable sin is committed by those who have no relationship with Christ. And their sin was willfully to reject the evidence and the conviction of the Holy Spirit who was working visibly in Christ's life through the power of the Holy Spirit in casting out these demons. And they were attributing his uh, power to cast out demons to the devil. And so Jesus was saying to them, by rejecting the Holy Spirit's conviction and testimony, you're committing an unpardonable sin. So, first of all, we need to understand that this term to fall away is not a technical term for apostasy. As we mentioned, this is the only place this verb occurs in the New Testament. Literally, it's a compound verb. It means to fall beside. The idea here is by falling beside, it's, uh, they, they, they don't actually keep the course. They're turning aside. They're falling in sin in a way that leads them astray from God's intended path that's the meaning uh, in uh, literally of this term just looking at it in its uh, in its meaning but uh, we see that this term is actually used many times in the greek translation of the old testament what we call the septuagint now 
the Septuagint, just like our English Bible, just like our Chinese Bible, the Septuagint is a translation. But it has a positive benefit because it translates the Old Testament into Koine Greek, the same language that the New Testament was translated in. It was, it was a translation that was performed by Jewish scholars. These are people that understood the Old Testament Hebrew. And so they were choosing Greek words to translate the Hebrew that, uh, that, uh, that they felt were the closest in meaning to what the Hebrew was trying to communicate. So there is, there's value for us in comparing how they use this term in the Old Testament, in their translation of the Old Testament. And so I want us tonight to just look at one example of how uh, uh, this word is used in this Old Testament translation. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. Ezekiel, chapter 18. Verse 24. Ezekiel 18, 24. You please follow along. I'll read this text. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them, he shall die. Now, the word because of the unfaithful of unfaithfulness of which he is guilty is this Chinese, uh, excuse me, this Greek word that's used here in the book of Hebrews. It describes a serious sin of unfaithfulness to God's covenant. So in the Old Testament, they were responsible to keep the Old Testament covenant law. And when a person was unfaithful to the covenant, the Greek word that they used to translate this idea was the idea here of this word to fall away or to fall beside. Now, the the aorist tense of this verb, it's a past tense of this verb, indicates a specific act of sin which a person commits, which violates his, uh, his covenant relationship with God and which invites God's discipline and judgment on his life. So we can conclude that this verse is not a warning about the sin of apostasy at all because a true believer cannot fall away in this sense uh, to turn away completely and finally from the faith. That He's kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So therefore, some interpreters suggest that the author is warning his readers about a hypothetical case. They're, they're, in other words, they're interpreting this to say the author is saying to these readers that uh, if a, a Christian actually could commit this sin, then he would it would be impossible to renew him to repentance. And so they're saying, uh, you know, if this could actually happen, but of course it really can't, but if it could happen, this would be the consequence. Now, the problem with that is because a warning that doesn't apply to someone is not a warning at all. Uh, If you're saying to someone, beware of this sin, but you're saying you're a true Christian, you could never actually commit it, uh, it doesn't connect. There's a problem with that. So we need to recognize that this is a warning to believers concerning a particular sin of another kind. This is not talking about the sin of apostasy. Well, then what is it talking about? And to understand that, we simply need to look at the context as we began to do already and understand that this word is closely related verbally to other words that the author has already used in the previous context. So here the word, as we mentioned, is to fall beside. But think about that word to fall. Does the author use this word fall to talk about sins that Christians can commit? And the answer is yes. Look back at chapter 4 and verse 11. We already read this once. Let's look at it again. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. 
Now, this is the simple verb to fall in Hebrew in chapter six. It's the compound verb to fall beside. But the verb itself is the same. And here he's warning Christians about the danger of falling in disobedience or in unbelief and not entering God's promised rest. And this takes us back to an earlier verse. We see this in chapter three and verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So again, he's talking to brethren, he's talking to Christians, and he's warning them of the danger of of having an unbelieving heart that causes them to depart from the living God. Well, it's obvious if they're brethren, if they're Christians, this departure is not an ultimate departure. It's not a complete apostasy. But it's talking about a spiritual failure through unbelief that brings God's severe judgments on the life of the Christian. And so here, again, this also takes us up to chapter 3 and verse 17. And again, we see this word comes out again. Uh, it says, now with, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Notice that their corpses fell in the wilderness. And so he's talking about those who fall beside, those who fall away, those who depart from the living God. And so this sin involves willful willful disobedience to God, a refusal to progress to spiritual maturity and to exercise faith. Now, all Christians regularly commit many sins of weakness often. If we're honest, we admit and acknowledge that we regularly and often sin against God, that we're weak. We often demonstrate our unbelief toward God. In many ways. But this sin is not simply a sin of weakness. This is a sin by act and by choice in which a believer decisively refuses to believe and obey God's word of promise. Just as the Jews in the wilderness did. God gave them a promise that he would bring them into the land of Canaan and they refused to believe it. And when we act in this way, when we decisively refuse to believe and obey God's word of promise, we cross a line of no return through unfaithfulness and disobedience. And that is an act which can never be retraced. Now, that's, that's very serious sounding. It is, it is very serious. How do we understand this? What do we mean when we say they can never retrace their choice? Well, these Christians, these Jewish believers, were in danger of turning back to Judaism, compromising their faith in Christ. They were reverting to spiritual immaturity. They were failing to exercise faith in God's promises in Christ. They were failing to access the grace and help that they needed. And so the author was concerned that they were in danger of committing this sin. And so he offers this warning, which has a direct application to us as well. Under God's new covenant, we too can cross the line by being unfaithful to God's new covenant revelation brought to us by Christ. And so he goes on to say, it is impossible to renew them to repentance. As we said, this is the kernel of this sentence. This person, this believer who has all of these spiritual experiences and blessings and privileges, and yet he falls aside from uh, from believing and acting on God's word of promise through unbelief. That it's impossible to renew them to repentance. Now again, this raises questions in our mind. The word repentance already occurred in verse 1. There it occurred in respect to the idea of inward repentance. 
where we turn away from sin as part of that act of conversion in which we turn from sin and we turn to Christ. But here, the the idea is not uh, specifically a reference to this inward repentance. When it talks about it's impossible to renew them to repentance, it's talking about the experience of the Jewish uh, of the Jewish people in Kadesh Barnea. Let's let's just go back and look at something there in Numbers chapter fourteen that I think will help us to have a clear picture of exactly what the author is trying to communicate here. Numbers chapter fourteen. In Numbers 14, we see the spies return from the land of Canaan. They give their report, and the people uh, burst out into weeping and wailing that uh, God has brought them into the wilderness to kill them, that their children are going to be a prey. Look in chapter 14 and verse 4. So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Well, in verse 11, then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? And so he goes on to say in verses 26 through 35 that God gives an oath that these people will not enter the land of Canaan, that their corpses will fall in the wilderness, that they'll die to the last man. And God makes that judgment with an oath. Now, here's the point that we're getting to. Look at verse 39. Uh, I'd like for you to read these verses along with me, if you would. 39 down to the end of the chapter. Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, now, why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies. For the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. And you shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, nor Moses, departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. Now, the point here is that the children of Israel, after they heard God's sentence of judgment on their sin, they were sorry for their sin. And so they they go to Moses and they say, you know, we've sinned. We we repent. We're sorry. Uh, We're going to go into the land of Canaan after all. But here's the point. God would not relent. And God would not permit them to go into the land of Canaan. Now, here's two things I want you to notice. There are two things God would not permit these people to do. They wanted to go back to Egypt. God did not permit them to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go into Canaan. God did not permit them to go into Canaan. What did they do? They died in the wilderness. They wandered until the last man was dead. That's what this passage is pointing to. Here, the idea of renewing them to, to repentance is the, context, is, is the, the, uh, the concept that it is impossible for them to find a place of repentance which, in which God will reverse the consequences of their choice, in which God will remove the consequences of their sin. This declares that no repentance afterward can ever bring about a change in God's irrevocable judgment upon them because of this sin. Now, what does this mean for for Christians? When Christians commit this sin, it brings God's discipline into their lives. Now, every Christian experienced discipline. Chapter 12 tells us about the discipline that all Christians experience. But this discipline is a, uh, if we can call it this, it's a judgment discipline. 
in which God basically writes Ichabod over their life, in which he excludes them from the privileges that they previously enjoyed. He, uh, he uh, uh, does not allow them to advance and mature. They've rejected spiritual maturity, and so he uh, basically he consigns them to, uh, to remain in this state of spiritual immaturity until they die. And in fact, in 1 John chapter 2, we're not going to go there, or excuse me, chapter 5, John, John talks about there is a sin unto death, that there are some Christians that uh, because they have committed this sin that God actually shortens their physical life. Now, we're not done with these verses, but this is where we're going to stop tonight. We need to recognize that these are genuine believers who are in danger of forfeiting new covenant blessings in this life as well as rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Let me just read a statement. Uh, This is how one commentary described this sin. He says, Temporally, this discipline involves loss of opportunity to go on to maturity in the Christian life, loss of effective service for Christ in this life, Loss of the blessings of God that come from an obedient life. And in some cases, perhaps, premature physical death. Eschatologically, in other words, in terms of end times, it involves loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And perhaps loss of position of leadership or service in the coming millennial kingdom. These are the consequences of this sin. Now, we still have more to say, as I mentioned, verse Uh, The end of verse 6 here, uh, we have one more question. Why does God view this sin so seriously? That's the last question we're going to answer. But I want you to notice here for uh, for, uh, our conclusion tonight that this is not a sin that you want to commit. That Christians who commit this sin cross a line that they can never retrace. And perhaps, you know, we cannot judge. God is the one who judges the hearts. It's not our place to judge the lives of other believers. But perhaps you can even think of some people that you know in which their life seems to simply be a constant round of wandering in the wilderness. That's the picture of what this Christian experiences as a result of God's judgment. This is what we want to avoid. Now let's put this back into the context The author's goal is he wants us in chapter 6 and verse 1, let us go on to maturity. Do you want to avoid this sin? The author tells us how. You've got to keep growing. You've got to keep going forward. You can't go backwards. You can't be lazy. You can't, as chapter 2 says, we can't just simply drift along in our Christian life. We have to be purposeful and diligent in pursuing Christian growth and uh, achieving spiritual maturity. Now, let me say it this way. A growing Christian is in a safe position. As I said, there are no perfect Christians. But if you are growing in your Christian life, You're safe. This warning is for those who refuse to grow. Who refuse to respond with faith and obedience to God's new covenant revelation in their lives. In a person who is lazy spiritually and is not growing in his Christian walk is in danger. This is not a sin that we want to commit because its results can never be reversed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you do clearly give us these kinds of warnings, that you give us Old Testament examples and illustrations, and you give us New Testament instructions and commands uh, and, uh, and warnings. And so we pray that you would help us to have open ears, to listen, to hear the message that you have for us, We ask that you'd help us to be diligent, to go on to spiritual maturity in our lives, that we would keep growing and going forward to becoming 
more like Christ, to allowing the Spirit to work change so that we have a renewed mind. And we pray that you would help us to grow in our holiness and our sanctification, to grow in our knowledge of God and of Christ, and that you would continue to do your transforming work in our lives to continue to carry us forward until the day when we see Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.